Hey everyone, uh, thank you for attending the talk, uh, Surviving 51% Attacks in Blockchain. My name is Yaz, um, a developer relations at C Labs, and this talk for DEF CON for the Blockchain Village is about how to, what happened during 51% attacks and how to mitigate, how to minimize their impact, and how to handle them in general. Um, and yeah, uh, let's get started. Um, so, um, my name is Yaz Squirry. I'm a developer relations, been working in crypto for a while um, in crypto communities since 2018. And I've been a, a community member um, within Ethereum was when I first got attracted to crypto back in 2016. Um, and my background has been in software and hardware engineering. I've worked on Ethereum Classic. I've worked with the Ethereum um, community and with Hyperledger and the EEA. And currently I work on Celo. Um, and I really love um, the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So run EVM. And yeah, so let's get started with the talk. So for the agenda for today is we're gonna first, we're gonna, this is all about 51% attack and how to like uh, handle 51% attack in blockchain. First, we're gonna cover what is Nakamoto consensus. Um, Nakamoto consensus is super important, even if you understand it to some degree, to try to like define what are 51% attacks and how they occur. Then we're going to talk about blockchain reorgs and 51% attacks. Um, then we're going to give a recap of the first 51% attack on ETC summer of 2020. Um, then we're going to give a brief recap of the following two 51% attacks on ETC. Um, we're also going to cover the impact of the 51% attacks on uh, blockchain in general by the analysis done on ETC. Um, we're going to talk about all the solutions that have been proposed on chain last year um, and continue to do so, and also all the solutions proposed off chain. Finally, um, we're going to talk briefly about we org attacks now with MEV, which it stands for minor extractable value. So yeah, we're gonna cover the first section. Let's try to understand what 51% attacks are and before we talk about ETC. So what is Nakamoto consensus? From a high level, Nakamoto consensus is a solution to the Byzantine generals problem. So the Byzantine generals problem is a famous problem in computer science. Basically from a high level, you're trying to answer the question, if you have an environment where you have multiple independent nodes, how do you create consensus around the majority of those nodes so, so that they all can reach agreement? Because you're presuming that like some of those nodes are gonna be faulty and stuff. And, um, but in that situation, you still wanna start to solve the situation to get the majority of the nodes to agree on consensus. And Nakamoto consensus is a solution to that problem. Nakamoto consensus also requires proof of work. So proof of work um, in from the context of mining is basically independent computers that are competing with each other to solve cryptographic problems that are computationally heavy. Um, and that is uh, the, like the proof of work from a high level. It also Nakamoto consensus requires that the longest chain is the most valid chain. So what is the longest thing? It's not the longest chain if it has more blocks than another chain necessarily. It's the longest chain if it's the one with the heaviest amount of work. So the heaviest amount of work would consider it the longest chain. So the consensus mechanism that is Nakamoto consensus solved the Byzantine generals problem up to 51% of the network, which is measured in hash rate. So in other words, if you define the entire spread of the network in hash rate, like um, hash rate, which is um, how like the miners are mining and like the rate of mining and producing hash is what we consider the hash rate. So the consensus mechanism solved the Byzantine general problem up to 51% of the network. So up to 51% of network can be like, up to 50% of network can be like honest and um, anything higher, it can start to like impact the network. Um, and if you read the Bitcoin white paper, Nakamoto consensus essentially is the most important innovation in the Bitcoin white paper. So let's touch up on Uncle Blocks before we go into reorg and stuff. Uncle Blocks are happen when you have two blocks that are produced at the same time by two independent miners. 
Um, so let's take a look here before we describe it more. So if you look at block 10, which is like, um, like the, the last block, and then you have block 11, the one after it, and then block 12. Let's, let's assume on block 13, um, two miners at the same time uh, discover a block. So what's going to happen is this temporarily splits the network into two, into two chains. Um, and all the miners will either mine on either chain at the same time. And once the next block is produced on one of the chains, in this case, the top chain produced found block 14 before the lower chain, then the lower chain would be like the block in the lower chain would be considered an uncle. So that's how the uncle gets produced. Um, yeah, so in Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, due to faster block generation, uncle block generation is much higher because uh, blocks are being produced every uh, between 12 to 15 seconds. And because of the rate of production for blocks, chances are another miner is going to find immediately a block and uncle, the uh, uncle block rate is being generated higher than in like compared to Bitcoin, which is a 10 minute block window. Miners here can include uncle block up to six block headers from the chain head. So let's assume um, block 14, like let's assume it's a block number um, 19 or 20. Um, so you can go up to six block headers. Um, that's when you can extract the uncle and get the uncle reward um, up to six block. After that, it becomes, uh, there's no reason, like it can be extracted and like um, there's no rewards there. Um, like, so for every block that trying to get the uncle block up to six blocks, the rewards keep on decreasing on the uncle rewards. Now let's talk about reorgs. Reorgs are um, an event where a block that was part of the chain that was canonical and its children block are replaced by another chain that has more work generated and therefore is a newer longer chain. Let's talk about this a little bit more by talking, looking at the diagram. Um, so I realized that the diagram first is talking about an attacker's chain, but before we even think about attacks, right? Let's think about how would this situation happen um, in, in, the, uh, in, a, in a normal environment and stuff. It's very rare for this to happen, especially with long uh, blocks uh, reorg, but let's assume um, there's a chance that it can happen non-maliciously. So let's assume at block number 10, um, there's an internet outage in China, or there's a firewall in China that doesn't allow the Chinese, like internet in China, to communicate with the rest of the world. Um, we know that currently Bitcoin migration is leaving China, you know, going to North America, but let's assume that's not the case for now. So, assuming uh, the Bitcoin mining operation in China is much heavier, like hash rate related, um, compared to like the rest of the world. Um, so with this, um, let's say at block number 10, there's that um, uh, internet disruption um, uh, like or disconnection between the internet in China and the rest of the world. So what's going to happen? If you look at the top one, let's assume this is not the attacker chain, but let's assume this is the heavier chain because it's the, uh, the chain um, with mining pools in China. So that's going to keep on mining locally in China. Um, it's going to be disconnected geographically. Uh, from another network than the, the other chain, which is um, like the global chain. Um, and the normal, like the global chain is going to continue mining without uh, including blocks from China or hash rate from China. But let's assume this only happens momentarily. Like there's an internet outage in China that probably like 10 minutes or something, and then it recovers. So because China has a higher hash rate in this example, what's going to happen is by block number 16, or like whenever like the internet uh, comes back on or like it doesn't get firewalled or whatever, um, the, re the geographical rest of the network is gonna see this incoming block from China and realize it has a heavier amount of work than what's currently on chain. So it's gonna in invalidate the ca canonical chain. It um, and it's going to include all the blocks coming from China. So blocks 11, 12, 13, 14, that happened the moment there was an internet outage will get included and stuff um, on all their transactions. So what happened to the transaction inside the canonical block or the not canonical block is more if you're um, attacking, but you know, like a definition if you're attacking, but let's assume, this is, let's call it the geographical chain. All the transaction in it will get removed 
um, and because the block is being reorg, they're going to go back to the transaction pool and they'll be waiting to be re-included back into the network, into the blocks. Um, so this is the, you know, very rare event. However, it can be done maliciously. So malicious um, reorgs are when, or 51% attacks is when um, assuming this, instead of an internet outage, the attacker is on purpose not connecting or peering with the rest of the network and not bra broadcasting their blocks. And they do this because they have um, a higher amount of hash rate than the rest of the network. And then um, when they feel like they have enough block depth, they broadcast their blocks to the rest of the network and that would reorg the chain. So we're going to cover later uh, double spend, but normally what happened in the attacker chain, it's not going to have a lot of transaction because it's not really an honest uh, chain. It might have one or two transactions just for the double spend attacks. Um, while all the transactions in the canonical honest chain will get um, removed and go back to the transaction pool and waiting to be re-added to a newer block. Um, so if a block depth is one or even like two blocks, that's really normal because of latency, latency delays, because this is a geographically distributed network. Um, someone who discovered a higher, like a block with a higher work than was already included in the chain, there might be a brief delay and then that gets added. Um, when 51% um, attackers, when a miner can control more than 51% of the entire hack and it allows them to rewrite the chain history. So now that we covered what 51% attacks are, let's do an overview of ETC 51% attacks. So I like to call this event from like the summer 2020, um, the hot 51% attack summer. So three at 51% attacks in late summer 2020 happened on Ethereum Classic. ETC experienced uh, before that a 51% attack in early 2019 before, like in January 2019, there was an ETC 51% attack. Um, but the one that we're going to cover for this talk is the one that happened in summer 2020, in late summer 2020. Um, all the attack resulted in double spend. With the last one, it's not really clear. Like the third 51% attack of the summer, it's not clear um, or the amount that's been double spent. Um, and the block depth kept on increasing with, with each following attack. Um, the victims were mostly uh, centralized exchanges and the losses were in the millions of, in USD. The mining pool that got reorged also lost on their block reward. So that was really interesting um, as a situation because um, a lot of people who believe in Nakamoto consensus philosophically don't really consider the impact it has on miners, especially if the block reorg depth is really super high and stuff. And what ended up being a situation, mining pools were complaining. They were really suffering because all their block rewards had been removed. And um, yeah, it really impacted the miners. So let's do a breakdown of the first 51% attack. So um, I've been woken up at 4 a.m. on a Saturday night by Judson, Hudson Jameson. He called me. Uh, he, Hudson, one of the community managers in Ethereum, he did an amazing job. He, call, he called me at 4 a.m. I was like sleeping on a Saturday night, August 1st. And he told me about the network, like, you know, ETC being 51% attack. So woke up, network would be 51% attack, started talking to some of the um, en engineers uh, working at Open Relay, who detected that attack and doing an analysis. So we started doing analysis together early in the morning. So we realized the block depth for this attack with 3,594 blocks from blocks 1090, 41, 46 to 1090, 77, 40. So the offending miner is our uh, 0x75D is what we call him for now. Um, but the more interesting issue on top of the 51% attack was ETC as a network was split into two networks, like for a long time, they were not like, you know, adjusting this stuff. And the reason for this is what we call a reorg cap. So what is a reorg cap, right? So immute, like when you think about immutability as a philosophy and a concept in network as a specification, um, Immutability is like, you know, data cannot be changed for like, you know, probabilistically for a long time, uh, forever. Um, in Bitcoin, there's the immutability argument in Ethereum and it like Ethereum classic specifically is all about immutability. 
the problem with immutability as a specification is it doesn't really reflect the reality from a node and client, like Ethereum client um, behavior. The reason for that is because clients need to have a specific amount of reorg uh, limit that they can include within their software. And the reason for that is because of like memory requirement, performance requirements and stuff. Like if you include more than that limit, it really degrades performance. So what we discovered was, and um, in this scenario, two different Ethereum clients had two different uh, reorg caps. So Open Ethereum, which used to be called Parity, had a 3000 block depth, which is different than Geth's reorg cap of 90,000. Now, this is a consensus inconsistency, and that's the problem that still exists today in Ethereum clients. Um, luckily, in Ethereum is super expensive, expensive to get over the 3000 block depth. However, an APC was really cheap at the time. Now, if you remember, the real cap for uh, parity, uh, like open Ethereum, is 3,000 blocks. Now, what was the, the reorg limit? Uh, the reorg uh, number? 3,594 blocks. That was the reorg. So the reorg, the 51% attack was higher than the reorg cap for parity. So parity, what happened in parity, um, open Ethereum, it saw the new incoming reorg that was higher than the reorg cap, and it said, wait a second. I'm not supposed to be including you because you're higher than my reorg cap. So I'm going to reject this reorg. And we like parity nodes, which were a minority on the network, kept you know validating on the older chain. Get reorg is 90,000. It's a huge number. So the majority of the network was using uh, a forker gap called core gap. Um, and they had the 90,000 uh, reorg cap. So they accepted the reorg from the attacker and it continued uh, mining on the majority chain. Um, this, from a coordination point of view, it was been like, it was kind of like really hard to try to understand what was happening early on. And then it became very challenging to coordinate, but the coordination mechanism and how to fix it was basically doing an at we trying to figure out everyone who was running an open Ethereum node and requesting that they, um, start running core gap instead um like which it did the get for because they're validating on the old chain they didn't know what the right chain was and you know if you follow the majority chain um it was easier from a coordination point of view to direct people to run uh, open ethereum node on the majority chain now it's like the other thing that happened with a double spend attack, which we're going to cover soon. Um, but like, yeah, it, from a coordination point of view, it was easier to get open Ethereum to um, either resync the client because once you resync with the rest of the network, the reorg is only local uh, information to the node, right? So if the node is resyncing from scratch, it's not going to get any reorg information. It's just going to continue syncing with the majority chain. So that was another option. So let's cover double spend attacks. So if you remember this diagram from before about reorg, right? So let's say I'm an attacker and I start to like on block number 11, I'm not broadcasting my blocks and I'm just like mining uh, privately um, without broadcasting my blocks. So how would I attack the network through a double spend attack? On block 11 below the one with the X, here's what, we do. Here's what they normally do. Um, Basically, the attacker deposits a large amount of Ethereum or Ethereum Classic in that case in exchange wallet A. So the exchange wallet like Binance and stuff, um, Binance or like Coinbase and stuff, um, these sort of um, like an example, the centralized exchange. Basically, the block like from, from, from the canonical honest chain, if you have a high value of um, Ethereum or Ethereum Classic, you basically deposit it um, into the uh, coin, into like a centralized exchange account. Now, what you do after is you trade that um, deposit for something that is not related to that network, like let's say Bitcoin. So you put your Bitcoin, Ethereum, you deposit it into Coinbase and you trade it for Bitcoin. Then you move your Bitcoin out of Coinbase or Binance. Now your Bitcoin is on your own, like privately owned, like externally owned account on the Bitcoin network, it's no longer part of the, you know, centralized exchange account. 
So what happens um, uh, in, to the attacker while you know mining on like privately while they're doing this attack? So on block 11, remember on block 11, um, on the canonical chain, they move their funds. So block 11 on the uh, attacker chain, they can move their uh, Ethereum to another Ethereum account. And we'll go over it in a second, why, why they do that. But yeah, so they do that and then, you know, they mine enough blocks to be heavier than the canonical chain and then they broadcast it. And then we covered what happens is when you broadcast it, if you, you see the red X marks here, that creates the reorg. So what happened in the reorg, um, the transaction that you, like the attacker did to send the money originally in the canonical chain to Coinbase, um, here in this example, will get invalidated. Um, and then we'll get pushed back to the transaction pool. Now, if it gets pushed back to the transaction pool and it gets remined in a future block, it would still transfer that same transaction with the same account back to the Coinbase, back to Coinbase uh, deposit and stuff. So you don't like if you, the attacker doesn't want to do that. So by moving um, in block 11 on the attacker chain, by moving it their, their, their Ethereum to another account, another Ethereum account, um, the, trans the transaction in the canonical chain, when it gets remined, it will be invalid because there's no more money in, in, in that account. So that way, that's how they double spend. They double spend by using that same account and trading it uh, on the canonical chain for Bitcoin. So now they have um, Ethereum and an equal value of Ethereum in Bitcoin. So let's talk about the impact of the first 51% attack of the summer. So because of this, there's been a major migration away from open Ethereum as 3000 block reorg cap was too risky. So folks decided like this is too risky. It's already the 51% attack was higher than the reorg cap. So it was too risky to stay around. Clients um, like uh, Ethereum clients mostly adopted were Core Geth and Hyperledger Boisu. Core Geth was the majority of the network. Um, and Hyperledger Basu, which is an Ethereum enterprise um, client, uh, people started running that as well. Um, some people, like we just discussed earlier, chose to restart their open Ethereum node, even though they were discouraged and encouraged more to uh, support Core Geth and Hyperledger Basu. That led to a, um, to a brief issue around centralization around Core Geth being the dominant node in the network and having one client development team building on that. Um, but the trade-offs were, you know, like compared to staying with the open Ethereum was like, it, it felt it was better just to move everyone to Core Depth. Um, there's been a heavy increase in block confirmation depths on Coinbase, other exchanges followed, we, we'll cover that in a sec. Uh, and then there's risk of delisting ETC surface, uh, mostly from OK Exchange. Um, the first, uh, like OK Exchange was as well the, the, the victim of this attack. And it resulted in 807,000 ETC stolen in that double spend attack. So that was like a number in, in multi millions. So let's cover a brief summary of what happened for the two following attacks. So the first one started in like July 31st. Uh, we discovered it by early morning, late night, uh, August 1st after midnight. And the second one, August 8th, 2020. The block we ordered here was 4,236 blocks. The one before that was about 3,500. The double spend amount was 465,000 ETC, about 3.3 million. So Bitfinex was one of the victims and not the, the only victim because the attacker was, uh, started moving allocation of the funds separately to some exchanges and to other accounts and stuff. And Bitfinex was one of the victims. Um, majority were get nodes as network moved away from open Ethereum. So there was no another chain split because by then people were being directed away from uh, open Ethereum to get. So the interesting thing about this was the attacker used stolen funds from the first attack to do the second one. And this is based on the analysis done by BitQuery, which also discovered the Bitfinex uh, was one of the victims. For the third attack, um, which followed on August 29, 2020, the block reorg here was 7,000 blocks deep. That was about two days worth of block reorgs. Um, nobody at that time did any double spend amount, uh, like analysis and how much was uh, double spent. Um, by then it was a weird attack because it was very suspicious timing. It happened right when 
um, the community decided to have a call about mitigating those attacks and how to mitigate them. So it's a very suspicious timing. So here's the cool thing um, that, you know, most of the attack came from NiceHash. Um, NiceHash would tell you that it doesn't come from them because they don't own any hash rate, but they're just a marketplace for uh, hash, hash rate providers um, looking to rent out their hash rate and people looking to bid on rentable hash rate and stuff. But yet be, being the market maker and not doing any KYC, they should, you know, have some sort of blame for this, but that was like the gist of it. But like, because the, the like the attack came from NiceHack or from the rentable marketplace that they um, do a market making operations on, you can notice that the first attack happened around 1st of August. So the attacker rented hash rate on NiceHash and that's how you see a spike. So the spike is basically the price of like, uh, the price here for the um, rentable hash um, for Ethereum ETH hash, which is um, like the hashing algorithm, it spiked up. What it spiked up means there's less amount because, and so the price increases for the remaining amount. So that spike was used for this duration of the attack. The second attack, you can totally see the spike as well around the 6th of August and stuff. And that was like that. And this diagram came from BitQuery, but like the image is actually like nice hash dashboard. So let's talk about like what happened, the impact of those attack and the mitigation strategies. So what is the impact of the 51% attack? So we covered this briefly before, but centralized exchanges increased their block confirmation. Um, many heavily increased it to two weeks of blockchain confirmation, at least for ETC, um, including especially Coinbase. Now, the reason you increase your blockchain confirmation during a double spend, if you remember before, um, the attacker would have to like you know on the on the honest chain um let's go back to this yeah so the attacker on the honest chain would have to send their money to a centralized exchange and deposit it and then they would have to convert it to bitcoin to withdraw by centralized exchanges when they increase their confirmation so the longer the confirmation is um on the exchange before somebody on that exchange can use that money um the harder it is or the more expensive it is for the attacker to pull off the attack because remember at the same time the attacker is mining on a uh, private chain or like a hidden chain and that costs the attacker money as well so by increasing confirmation time for two weeks that means the attacker would have to be mining for more than two weeks in order to pull off this attack which is super expensive even for ethereum classic um so yeah so that was like the resulting um, um, uh, mitigation strategy by uh, exchanges, which was actually recommended to them by the Ethereum Classic community, like increase your blockchain confirmation. However, um, there's also um, philosophically, there might be better alternative that where you do it depending on the transaction size. But yeah, um, then, there was a discussion about majority honest miners to fulfill Nakamoto consensus security assumptions. Now, I understand this is a mouthful, but basically, if you read the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto talks about majority honest miners, like that's how you can fulfill the security assumption of Nakamoto consensus. You can only fill um, majority honest miner security assumption if you have if you're the dominant network using that hashing algorithm. So this, in this case, Ethereum Classic was using ETH hash mining algorithm, but it was not a majority honest miner situation because ETC using ETH hash is also the same reality with Ethereum. Ethereum uses ETH hash and they're a majority network. So in this example, ETC is a minority chain. So a majority honest miner on Ethereum might not necessarily be um, honest miners on ETC because uh, ETC is just like a smaller hash rate compared to Ethereum in this case. Um, the other thing that was being done was KYC on nice high thigh orders, which didn't work. Basically, uh, some folks on ETC labs requested that nice hash need to do KYC on all the buy orders to know. So once you, if you do KYC, you can tell where the attacker is coming from because you know who the attacker is. But NiceHash um, didn't want to do that. So the ETC lab team worked with CypherTrace and legal work against NiceHash. 
the angle they were, they had was that it's in violation of the CFAA, which stands for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, because they're the angle, like the argument argument was, they're enabling selling hash power as a cover for money washing. Uh, and then chain analysis uh, was con you know consulted on cracking stolen funds. The problem with these analysis as well is the attacker can be using using stolen uh, identity or like stolen account for exchanges in order to do this um, execute this attack. And the moment that the money um, transferred to other exchanges in different jurisdictions like Russia, it becomes super hard to track down where's the money going. Um, and then the other impact which we covered before is honest mining pools lose their rewards and that was like very painful for them and like it was something that was um like it, it you know it inspired like trying to figure out more solutions so that miners can continue honestly mining there was also we talked about the listing with like okay exchange with the major one of them and finally like network stability is a big issue because in a way, it's a consensus uh, destabilization situation where the consensus is keep like getting reorged and stuff. And for, for the average user, it's like inconsistent use of the network. So let's talk about the solution for, for proposed on chain and stuff. So the most popular, like one of the most popular one is the hashing algorithm chain. So we covered before um, majority honest miner to fulfill Nakamoto consensus security assumptions. So the best way to like, you know, fulfill the security assumption of Nakamoto consensus is if you have a dominant hashing algorithm, especially specifically for your network. Um, that way you can create a new marketplace for this algorithm. Um, miners can build uh, like ASIC if they desire and it becomes the majority chain that uses that mining algorithm. And that way you don't have to rely on ETH hash um, in order which ETH hash is more dominant on Ethereum. And that way ETC does not become a minority chain. Um, one of the proposals was like k 256, uh, which was SHA-3, and that was the most popular one. So it was a popular story, but it hasn't been even a year later implemented. The other thing with MESS, MESS stands for Modified Exponential Subjective Scoring. Um, it's been controversial, but it's been implemented on a node level. So in other words, it did not require a hard fork. It was on the node level. So any get node can implement like toggle mess um, in order to mitigate um, or minimize the impact of 51% attack. Now, what does it do exactly? Basically, mess adds subjectivity to how nodes perceive new blocks that appear much later than what is considered canon. So the, the longer it takes for a new block to appear, um, that might attempt to reorg. Um, there's an exponential function there, um, and it makes the, the node more subjective about how it perceived them. So it takes longer for it to peer with the new chain and stuff. Um, it doesn't really mitigate 100%, 51% attack, but it heavily discourages it. Checkpointing um, was proposed by IOHK. It was not a very popular choice um, because it relied on an external node and it removed the need for Nakamoto consensus. So that has not been a very popular choice because in ETC, the community is very um, almost religious about Nakamoto consensus. Merged mining with Bitcoin proposal from Rootstock was not popular either. So the problem with merged mining um, is you rely on the entire security of a larger network like Bitcoin, which might make sense. But like, if you think about it, um, anytime anyone wants to sync up a node with Ethereum Classic or any other network that is smaller, that is merged mine, um, they also need to sync up the larger network and stuff. And that's like, that proved to be very, um, from a user experience, um, really bad. Um, and at the same time, merged mining philosophically doesn't really fulfill um, like honest mining with proof of work and Nakamoto consensus because you're relying on the security of another network. So the proof of proof from very block, um, it's not been very popular. Uh, it's been discussed, but it's like a solution that the best way to describe it, nobody wanted because it removed the need for proof of work because you're mining on another chain and stuff that is more um, according to their paper, environmentally friendly they even been proposed, trying to propose this on Bitcoin and it's not been popular. 
So there's a penalty system, there's multiple. Um, Pearl Guard, which um, is enabled on Pearl and Callisto, and it was inspired by the Horizon Network penalty system. Basically, what this setup is on chain, um, if you if you have a reorg depth of higher than 60 blocks, um, there's a penalty system involved, and that penalty system would force you to um, pay the penalty in order to include your longer chain here. Um, the problem with this approach is that it, it introduces a new type of attack that can fragmentize and split the network cheaply, and also eclipse attacks can happen with this model. So the solutions proposed that have been off-chain uh, solution, one of them is defensive mining. So in defensive mining, um, you have a collection of mining pool that are honest miners. In the event that a chain is getting reorged, defensive mining can trigger and try to remine the whole chain um, from that block that got reorged and try to include all the transaction pool like the way it's been and stuff. The problem with defensive mining is that it's going to be a net negative attack between the attackers and the defenders. And the only one who wins it is the one who doesn't run out of money because it becomes expensive and more expensive to reorg each other's stuff on a longer chain. Other off chain proposed solutions are monitoring system. So, nice hash monitoring, um, basically monitoring the order book for spikes. So, anytime there's a spike in nice hash, you get an alert and stuff. So, that was one of the approaches. Horquarts, which is my personal project, um, is an example of that. So reorg monitoring monitoring is basically when you monitor reorg and, and you alert the uh, participant when a reorg and double spend happens. So immediately when there's a reorg, you get notified right away and it can help like mitigate against who's getting reorg. Combining pool monitoring is um, allowed you to monitor pools for suspicious work that doesn't follow the chain header. So let's say I'm, I'm mining with a pool and the pool previous block header doesn't match what is public on chain. That can indicate that they're mining offline away from the public network and there might be some malicious reason for that. Pool Detective is an example of that by MIT DCI and We Are Monitor, which we covered, We Are, we are Cracker is by Jane Plovjoy. Um, then uh, another approach is dynamic block depths for confirmation. Basically, whenever an exchange, um, so an exchange doesn't have to have a hard cap value like two weeks worth of confirmation, it can have a confirmation number based on the value being deposited. So if somebody wants to deposit one ETH and stuff, it doesn't really justify doing a long um, block confirmation um, on the exchange, but rather shorter one to reflect the amount. But if it's like millions of dollars, you're better off doing waiting a longer time uh, for the block confirmation. Another approach has been um, with centralized exchanges, instead of doing longer block confirmation, you do immediate or like whatever amount you already had confirmation, but you delay withdrawals. So you make sure that the attacker cannot withdraw uh, after, like, let's say they trade their Ethereum for Bitcoin, they can't withdraw it right away. So that way it minimizes bad user experience and then incentivizes more people to just continue like using their centralized exchanges. All right, so now that we covered this, let's talk about reorg and MEV briefly. So what is MEV? I'm gonna brush over it really briefly. MEV is what we consider minor extractable value, which is a term coined by Phil Dayan. Um, in blockchain, transactions are designed to be included in the network, even if not necessarily added to a block immediately because they're in the transaction pool. But blockchain design never specified transaction ordering or how is a transaction ordered in the block. So MEB basically allows miners to order transaction in the transaction pool in order to copy profitable like DeFi arbitrage transaction with front running, back running, and sandwich attacks. So in, in, a, in a simpler terms, basically, if I'm a miner, I look at the transaction pool, there's a lot of DeFi happening in Ethereum, and there's like a transaction that would allow for a very profitable arbitrage. So me, the miner, even using flash loans and stuff, I can mimic that entire transaction with zero cost and put my transaction on top of the original transaction when I submit that block. What that means is, that front running, by the way, what it means is it allows miners to front run the user transaction and take the profit for themselves and stuff. Um, and for the for the rest of the P, and they still can take the gas uh, fee from uh, the original transaction. 
So companies like Flashbot seek to minimize MEV by creating a blind auction for arbitrageurs or what they call searchers to bribe miners to include a transaction and minimizing impact on the transaction pool. So let's cover MEV reorg attacks. So given what we know about MEV in general, how is a reorg attack happen? So and it's a new attack vector specifically to Ethereum just because of the new, uh, like the high MEV found in the transaction pool. It's one of the latest areas of research into 51% attack vectors. It differs from other 51% attacks that require double spend due to a smaller block reorg depth. Um, basically, it's um, mining pools in theory you can see a mine like a block that was published with high MEV and reorg the network one to two blocks deep to capture those transactions. So I'm a miner. I see the new block being submitted that's been published. That block has a lot of MEV value in it, and it's like super profitable for me if I took that MEV instead and I reorg that network, even though it's been published by another miner. So what I would do, 51% attack the network and try to um, take all those transactions and add them to my block instead. Um, and that is like essentially what the attack is. It's a 51% attack that is one or two blue, one to two blocks deep because you're taking a lot of um, extractable value alpha, you know, arbitrage opportunities that belong to users or other miners. The problem with this attack is it causes a net negative effect on the entire network and major consensus instability. Because let's say I'm a miner, I find an MEV that's been published and in, in like high MEV block. Um, I reorg it one block. I take that MEV to myself, but there's nothing stopping another miner with the same amount of hash rate from capturing it back and different miners reorging each other. And it, like, it comes down to like how much they want to reorg and stuff. And it's like, this is the, like an important like uh, point because it, this is going to be major consensus instability. So mining pools have said that they want reorg the chain like like uh, they said they don't have intention of reorganization to extract MEV, but that's still to be seen. So let's talk briefly about like finally about potential mitigation and minimization strategies. So one way is to increasing uncle block rewards. Um, it doesn't really mitigate, but it allowed by larger uncle inclusion rewards would incentivize better mining. So more miners would mine on the canonical chain, try to include more of the uncle blocks just to get their reward. And if it's higher, it's more incentive for people to get those uncle block rewards. Um, another way is include like include the uncle hash rate and longest chain calculation. So on the canonical chain, it, a miner is including an uncle block. Un including that uncle hash rate within the canonical chain would increase um, what's the, considered the heaviest uh, chain, and that way um, it's heavier than any um, private chain that kind of reorg and stuff. And Otherwise, it's monitoring uncles and reorg. Used to find if any reorg MEV happen and or for uncle block, uh, uncle bandit attacks. Um, so we covered like monitoring systems. So it's very similar to what you would if you want to monitor nice hat or like uncles and stuff, and allow you to steep any monitor up to any misbehavior. Layer two um, at Oracle to determine canon chain. So let's say if you're using Optimism or Arbitrum. Um, to monitor, and you have an oracle there to monitor the layer one solution, like layer one network, and you have some sort of like either checkpointing or just like monitoring in a sense um, to tell, to determine what is the right chain. Now, the problem with this approach is layer two uh, solution always need to write back to layer one. So if there's a reorg tapping on layer one, let's say a layer two saying, oh, a reorg happened. This is not the canonical chain. Me, the attacker on layer one, can reorg that transaction and exclude it. So that L2 becomes um, problematic because it's like a separate network that can got reorg and stuff. Timeliness detected by Vitalik has been proposed in a blog post by Vitalik. Um, it's a really interesting um, one because it like allows node to perceive time, how time goes by. And when a new block um, or a new chain emerges, like it can be very like um, subjective based on the time that it appeared on. Another one is social pressure. So for mining pools that reorg the network, it would in theory destroy their brands and allow miners be like, hey, I don't wanna mine with this mining pool that's destroying Ethereum. I'd rather mine with an honest mining pool. 
Um, and that happened, um, well, in Bitcoin before, I forgot which mining pool, but it almost had 51% of the network, like in terms of hash rate, and miners immediately started leaving that mining pool to go to other mining pools. And that mining pool, like, became even the, like one of the smallest mining pool in terms of hash rate as a result. Finally, we need better transaction type that's um, for Ethereum and uh, that mitigate MEV. The one that allow us to specify the parent block header. So if I see the parent block header, I submit a block, I submit a transaction, I say, I want my transaction to, to tie in to the current block header that I'm seeing um, right now. So that gets added to the transaction pool. Um, if the reorg happened, the reorg happening will uh, tie it to a different uh, block header than the one that I specify, and that would make the transaction invalid. So that would be an interesting approach. Um, specifying an expiration date, how many blocks deep, um, like how long until the transaction gets added to the transaction, uh, from the transaction pool to the block. And if it goes more than that, how many blocks deep, then um, it becomes invalid. Otherwise, like if you know the specific mining pools that are misbehaving, um, having a way to whitelist specific mining pool or blacklist uh, misbehaving mining pool can be um, one way to mitigate against this. So yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk about how to survive 51% attack through analysis and stuff. You can email me at yaz.curry at gmail.com and you can find me on Twitter at yazinator. So thank you so much.